welcome. I hope that you have had a chance to go around to the, all the wonderful institutions and um, terrific staff who are here today. We are here to talk about clinical studies and clinical trials. And we have a wonderful um, panel here this morning. I'm going to talk a little bit about lupus research. Dr. Akinasi Anka is at Columbia University. She's going to talk about big words, interventional and observational trials. Wow, what is that all about? We're going to know by the time we leave. And then Rachel Drolet, also from Columbia, is has a very, very interesting role, and she recruits and coordinates uh, the patient sides of trials. Um, person that you would know very well. Were you fortunate enough to be at Columbia working up with these with these guys? And then, of course, our wonderful patient Camilla, who is back for the second panel today, who is going to talk about from the patient's perspective of being in a study and being in a trial. So my job is why is it important? for you to be here. How many people take medications for lupus? How many people are pleased with the medications that you take for lupus? One hand, okay. So that says we do need better, safer treatments, don't we, for lupus? I think everybody's in agreement with that. And it's a real shame that in over 50 years, we've only had one drug, Ben Lista, that's ever been developed just for lupus. So our goal is to change that, and that's why we're here today. I'll talk a minute about the Lupus Research Institute because you can't really do trials and clinical research until you understand the disease of lupus. And so that's why we started the Lupus Research Institute almost 15 years ago, was to get that research done and to do it in a new way because you can't keep doing the same old stuff in lupus and make any progress. You have to be creative. It's a complex disease. You have to think outside the box. We have to find investigators and scientists who are willing to take some risks, bring some great scientific ideas to the table, and get the job done. And that's what we do with the LRI. We fund smart people with great new ideas. And it's been an extraordinarily successful strategy because we have had the most pivotal discoveries in lupus over the past 12 to 15 years using this kind of an approach to research. We're very pleased with that. We're very proud of that. We now have a greater understanding of lupus, and guess what? The community is now all poised to move on to clinical studies and clinical trials. What does that mean? It means that we know enough, we go from basic research, we test stuff out in animals like those wonderful mice who are our best friends, you must know that, and then we see if the mice work out with humans, and if it does, voila, here we go, and we have something that we can bring for potential efficacy. Uh, with patients. So that's, that's the way things are done. I want to also give thanks to, certainly to our panel, but um, also thanks to Bristol Myers Squibb who uh, helped us uh, have this meeting here today and we're very, very um, pleased with that. So how do we get new drugs? Not too easily, right? I mean, look at this slide. Uh, it takes over a billion dollars in 15 years to bring a new treatment to market. But as I just said, We've made the progress, and we're still working on it, of course. We've made the progress in the drug discovery. It moves on to the other things. And oh, that's not a very good slide. You can't see it too well. Um, anyway, and as it moves down that continuum or that path, we get to the place where we can come to, to do clinical trials, and that's where we are now. OK, so how come this is so important? Because as companies are now understanding the disease as well, and are more and more, the bad news is we haven't had a drug in over 50 years, one. Um, and the good news is there's tons of companies now, look at that, over 30, I think it's even more than that, who are active now in that research space and, and looking at new drugs and new uh, treatments to be trialed out in lupus, and things that can immensely, immensely approve the safety and toxicity of the drugs that we're currently forced to use in the disease. So 80% of those trials don't make it. They can't even get the, the enrollment. What does that mean? It means that we need to have folks participate in trials. It, it can shut down the whole study. And it just delays the time that we have to get new treatments to patients. So 
One thing I want to say this morning, though, is this is a team effort. It's not just patients. Look at all the folks who are here. We have physicians. We have trial coordinators. We have patients. We have all, the whole team that works for us and works for you to get this done. This is everybody on board. If we're going to get new drugs in lupus and new studies done in lupus, it means everybody has to get on board. The researchers, the physicians, the staff at the hospitals, the advocates, the volunteers, the patients, all of us. It's like, think about tri a trial team approach to lupus. It's really, really important. So that's why we have eight institutions with 80 plus studies that are going to help. What we're here today is to help you meet your match. You're interested in knowing what a trial is. You're interested in if a study can work, because it's not going to work without us. You might be able to meet your match by looking for something that really, really uh, interests you and might be applicable to you. Um, we need your feedback. The whole lupus community, the medical community, the research community, the clinical community, we need to know what you're thinking. Tell us. Tell us. Ask questions. You can never ask enough questions about your own health. Get into this, guys. Get into it. Participate. There is nothing, nothing stronger than patient involvement, active involvement, and participation. Not just in the trials, but in this whole disease. Speak up. Keep up to date. Go to lupustrials.org. Find out what the latest studies are. You need to get into it and speak up. We are the best advocates for our own health, and we all, we all know that. And our goal here is to get everybody on the first page about how that can happen. So we're going to talk first about interventional trials and observational trials. So I hope that at the end of today, I'm going to be able to um, convince you that the right place for all lupus patients is as part of a clinical trial or a clinical cohort, so either an interventional or an observational study. Um, why is that? It is a rare disease. It's a disease where there are so many unknowns, starting from uh, why, um, why is it happening to me? Uh, why? Is this all different from other people with lupus? So there's a lot of unknown about the disease itself. It's a lot of unknown about making the diagnosis of lupus. It's a lot of unknown about doing the treatment. So the world is evolving. We, we should be all together in this, trying to bring in better diagnostic tools, better treatment tools, take lupus to, a 20, to the 21st century, because I feel like we're still in the 20th century, and not even at the end of the 20th century, but somewhere in the middle, stuck with old drugs, drugs with horrible side effects. So hopefully, we all will work together and bring this disease closer to where um, it's going to be easy to treat, easy to cure, and easy to move on with our lives. So, what are interventional trials? Interventional trials are trials where we test a drug, a device, of a, or a procedure. And that may not be for everybody. How about observational trials? Observational trials is where we learn about the disease. We monitor participants, patients over time. The researchers observe the natural history of the disease. And you'll say, well, you don't know it. Well, we're still learning about it. I feel like every day, I wake up in the morning, I see a new patient, and I learn about the disease. I'm humbled every day by, by the disease, by what I learn from you. So I feel like the more we put all of our collective knowledge together, the smarter we'll be. So a little bit about interventional research. So interventional research is about bringing new treatments, new combination of drugs, devices, procedures, to try and understand the impact of the disease and their role in treatment. So in, in general, interventional trials, in order to prove that a drug is better than no drug, we need to compare it to no drug, and the no drug is called placebo. So if the drug is a pill, the placebo will be a sugar pill. If the drug is an infusion, the placebo will be some water solution that looks like it and probably 
you know, is in all ways very similar to it, so neither me nor the patient that's participating nor even the pharmacist sometimes can tell the difference. It's the only way to remove the power of our minds from, from, you know, from the drug effect. So placebo is important for interventional trials, and sometimes, because lupus is such a complicated disease, we can't allow for people to be untreated. So sometimes we compare the new treatment of a new drug to the standard of care, be it cytoxin, be it Cellcept, be it Plaquenil. So these are the, the two ways we can compare drugs. Either we compare it to nothing, or we compare it to the standard of care. And in general, because of the nature of lupus, the clinical trials that have been going on so far in lupus research have looked at the ability, you know, they've always allowed the patients to continue the treatment that they're on. So let's get to the who, what, when, and where of lupus research. So who should participate in the trials? Well, obviously I said everybody, but not every trial is for everybody. So participants, especially for interventional studies, are subject to inclusion, exclusion criteria. Sometimes we exclude young folks, sometimes we, we exclude older people. So age sometimes can be an exclusion. Gender, well, lupus is a, you know, is, is a gender discriminating disease. So there, it's unusual that the, trial, the trials will exclude um, men, however, if we're looking at a trial that's looking at pregnancy, obviously men are not going to be there. The disease type or the disease stage, um, the treatment history, other medical conditions, all of these have to be taken into account in making the decision of who is going to be participating in a clinical trial. And then, interesting enough, other specific requirements. For instance, there were trials that did not include enough patients of black race, so now there's interest in trying to understand, is there something different? So there's, there are trials that are specifically looking at patients of black race or different ethnicities. Now, why? So I think this is the fundamental question. Why do we do certain things? And why should we participate in research? Why should you participate in research? So you can look at this in a couple of ways. So how about what's in it for me? And then on the other side, what do I risk? So what's in it for me? I want to do well for the world. Um, I want to have a contribution to medical research. I want to improve the health of others. That's wonderful, but it's, a, it's hard to motivate people on I want to do good for others. So what other things might motivate people to participate in research? Well, having a, an active role in your own health care, meaning be part of the decision making, um, intervene, make the changes you want to get the care you need. And then, to me, sort of the, the easier way to explain people why they should participate in clinical trials is because they might get better care. What do I mean? They might have access to medications that are not commercially available, so when we start telling you, I don't have more options, well, the other option is, you know, new drugs new drugs as part of a study. So you might access drugs before they're available. And I think that there's an implied um, guarantee of better or same care than you would otherwise. Um, however, there's also some stuff that comes with participating in research, and that means um, whoever is taking care of you is going to be more careful than they are when they're seeing you once a month or once every two months. So there's more attention to detail. There are multiple levels of scrutiny. Um, the, the investigator watches you, the company watches the investigator, the FDA watches the company. So there's multiple levels of making sure things are done perfectly and you get the best care that could possibly be. And then I think there's also comes with a little more access to, to your doctors, to the people that take care of you, to the nurse, to the staff. Um, because you're doing wonderful things for the world and for research, the doctors and the staff feel the need to reciprocate. So you'll have access to their cell phones, you'll have access to their direct lines, you'll be available, there, they'll be available for you 24 seven, which I think is extraordinary. Well, how about you know, what is there to lose by participating in a clinical trial? Well, you might need to spend more time on each visit. 
You might need to be there longer than you would on a regular day. You might need to get more blood work. And you're also possibly might, it may, there's also the possibility that you might get some side effects. So in the end of the day, you need to have a balance between what you hope to achieve and what you're risking. And if the balance says, I'm hoping to achieve more than I'm risking, I think the answer is participate in clinical trials. So how about what? What do clinical trials require? Um, each clinical trial has its own protocol. So there are very specific requirements that are study specific about when do you need to get your testing done, what are the procedures, what's the medication, what's the dose of the medications, how often you have to come in, how long the study is going to be. So there's a lot of rigor that comes with it. And with rigor comes, you know, some nuisance, but also better care. A lot of folks have thought of what is the best, what is the ideal schedule to have people come in to make sure that their health is perfectly monitored. What is the perfect dosage of this drug? What we don't know, we're going to explore a couple of dosages. So all of these things are well thought out and there's no, it's almost like we're taking the practice of medicine into the era of checklist medicine. We're going to be treating you based on a very well thought out checklist. And as we've learned from other places in, in medicine, checklists ensure better outcomes. Though they may interfere with the way we might do things spontaneously, they do lead to better outcomes and lupus patients need better outcomes. How about how, when, and where? How do I find information? How do I know about the current clinical trials? Where do I go? So first of all, you ask your doctor. Your doctor is your best resource. Your doctor should know about the clinical trials. They should be letting you know where these things are happening. Well, how about if the doctor doesn't know? Well, then you do come to the Lupus Clinical Trial Fair and, and you reach out to the SLE Foundation that has a lot of information about the trials that are available and, 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 and the doctors that are available in the community and then can guide you through the process of, of matching yourself with the best doctor. In a way, I, I, it just occurred to me as, as, as I'm sitting outside in, 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 in the area where you're seeing all of these doctors, all of these institutions, that today was an extraordinary opportunity to almost do a speed dating, meaning I need to figure out who is the perfect match for me, right? Is this doctor, is this medical center the place where I want to be taken care of? And if the answer today was with whichever one of the centers, yes, I think you should explore it. Um, I think just like in real life, you don't connect with everybody. You don't get along with everybody. The same thing is true for your doctor, your, the researcher, the person taking care of you. And if you think that that match is not perfect, improve it. Yeah. Be proactive. So how about other resources to find out about clinical trials? So clinicaltrials.gov, it's the NIH website, and it has an extraordinary database. You can search it by disease, so you can search it by lupus. You can search it by a specific drug. You can search it by what you're trying to achieve, by what the eligibility criteria. So it's an extraordinary resource. And then there's another search tool that is on the LRI's, lupus, um, on the LRI's website, which is lupustrials.org. So multiple ways to figuring out what is the right trial, what is the right place, where do I fit, where can I get my care be better. And how do I ultimately decide what's right for me? So I think that the right way to decide what's right for you is ask questions, be open-minded, always, always want more, always want better, don't settle. Just like you wouldn't settle in life, don't settle in your, in your care of, of lupus. So what happens after the clinical trial? Because a lot of times, you know, we wonder, well, I'm going to be in the clinical trial for a year, I'm going to be in the clinical trial for two years, I'm going to get better, things are wonderful, how about afterwards? And, and sometimes that's a little tricky, because if the drug is approved by the Food and Drug Administration, like it happened with Benlista, then you might be able to stay on the drug for forever or for a long time. How about if the drug is not approved, and that's happened a lot, but it helped you, what's going to happen next? So. There may be a waiting period, there may be a time before you can actually get the drug, 
or there may be a long time, or you might never be able to get the drug if the drug didn't benefit enough lupus patients and it didn't get approved. So it's a little tricky. So I think that there you need to go back to your doctor and ask the questions, what do I do next? How do I keep myself feeling good? How do I stop myself from getting sick again? Or how do I get, how do I, you know, how do I move on from here? And, and, and how about challenges? Because, you know, while clinical trials, I think, are an extraordinary tool, how about, you know, is there, they're not that easy because otherwise everybody would be doing them. So what are the big obstacles to lupus develop, to development of new drugs in lupus? One of them is the nature of the disease because lupus is difficult. Getting drugs for lupus is very difficult. And, and we'll go through some of those things that are, are, are giving me thoughts and, and, and troubles every day. And then the other big challenge is that, and, and that's part of the reason why you're, we're here, there are not, in, not enough patients for all the studies. There's a lot of interest now in lupus research. We want to have new drugs, but to have new drugs, we have to be part of this. I, as a doctor, I'll be there for you. You have to come, well, I and us, as the doctors, will be there for you. Come and, and talk to us about clinical trials. It's the only way we'll get more drugs approved for lupus. It's the only way we'll get to the next level in, in the care of lupus patients. So what about the nature of lupus? Well, lupus is rare. We know that already. It can affect people very differently. Some people can have skin disease. Some people can have brain disease, and it's still lupus. Sometimes lupus is difficult to diagnose. Lupus symptoms come and go. So they may come and go on their own, or they may come and go because you took a medicine. And sometimes it's difficult to decide whether the medicine is what made it go away or is just what would have happened anyway. Um, I'm, I'm, I think that the, the big heterogeneity of lupus is what makes it you know, interesting yet hard to treat and hard to diagnose. And, and the uniqueness of each patient is what's fascinating about it yet so complicated. And, and just because we're talking about uniqueness, um, people are, are trying to figure out what's the best way to design drugs for lupus and what's the best way to test them. And there are two ways of looking at this. You can either look at the whole disease and try to get a drug that works for every aspect of it, or you're trying to do a drug that works on a specific organ. For instance, we're all wanting and needing a drug that works for the brain, and we're not quite there yet. Hopefully, soon. Um, there are a lot of there's a lot of interest in drugs for kidney disease because it's been a little easier to measure the amount of, of lupus in the kidneys. Um, there's a lot of interest in having new drugs for for eye problems in lupus, uh, for GI, for gastrointestinal problems, and and the heart and the lungs. While none of the trials are truly addressing the heart and the lung um, acutely attacked by lupus, there's a lot of interest in trying to understand the long-term consequences and prevent those from happening. There's interest in drugs for skin lupus. There's interest in drugs for the, the blood problems of lupus and a lot of interest in the musculoskeletal development of new drugs for the musculoskeletal, for the aches and pains, for the joint pains, for the fatigue. So I'm going to just briefly talk to you about a couple of drug, a, a couple of, of interventional drug studies. Um, one of them is very interesting. It's a drug um, in very early development. It's phase one. Phase one means it's never been tried. So that would be 1A. The drug has never been tried in people. That's not the case here. This drug, this um, this particular drug, has been tried in a, a cancer of the cells that make antibodies. So the company is trying to develop a drug that would be sort of interesting for lupus, because lupus is a disease of antibodies. It's a drug that's directed against the cells that make the, anti the lupus antibodies. So they're looking at patients with lupus nephritis, and because they're sort of in an interesting place where they're kind of new on the, on, 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 on the market of lupus, and they're new to lupus, they're trying to see what about patients with lupus kidney disease that have been failing a lot of a lot of the other regular treatments. So a very interesting study um, with a very interesting mechanism of action, 
that's looking for patients with kidney disease that have not responded to a lot of treatments. What's, you'd say, beautiful, brilliant, what's the difficulty? Well, the, the target population, the people that we're looking for for the study, is a fraction of all patients with lupus nephritis. So it's a hard study to recruit for. So we need your help here. Um, that's another interesting thought. So um, we all love and hate prednisone at the same time. And I'm, I'm quite certain that a whole bunch of you hate prednisone more than they love it. Um, how many people are on prednisone? A lot. How many of you love it? Uh-oh. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Um, so it's, it's this hate-love relationship that we have with prednisone. It saves our lives. It, it saves patients' lives. It keeps people alive, yet it has devastating side effects. So there's a lot of interest in trying to develop an alternative to prednisone. And, and this is coming from um, the company that owns um, the Actar gel, uh, which is ACTH is the molecule that makes patients' bodies, our bodies produce steroids, so produce the equivalent of prednisone. Now it's an interesting study because this is a phase four. Phase four meaning the drug is already approved. Does it have a role in lupus? Now interesting, this is approved for lupus, yet it sort of you know went on the back burner because we all use so much prednisone and we kind of forgot about this. So there's an attempt to say, is this any better for the treatment of lupus and lupus nephritis than prednisone? And there's some data that suggest it may be, so a lot of interest in, in trying to find prednisone alternatives. Um, now, uh, there's, there are, um, Benlista has been approved, um, it's been about three years since, it's actually three years and a half since it got approved by the FDA for the treatment of lupus, yet we're not all running to take Benlista. And, and why, you know, why has that happened? I think we're all not very sure where it fits in, in the treatment of lupus. The FDA mandated several studies to try and understand where is the place of Benlista in the treatment of lupus. One of them is looking at does Benlista work for patients of black race? Um, why is that? In the beginning, there were not a lot of black patients that ended up in the study, so a lot of interest in trying to understand the role of Benlista. So I, if I have not completely um, won you over for participating in an interventional study, a drug study, I hope I can at least win you over for participating in observational research. What, what is the place for observational research? So from our end, we learn about the disease. We observe the natural history of disease. We watch patient over time. There's no assigned intervention, so whatever we do, whatever treatment the patient gets, it's all interesting. It's all learning. The patients continue on their current regimen. Um, however, sometimes we need healthy volunteers, so we might reach out to you to say, do you have a friend that's healthy, that doesn't have lupus, that wants to be part of this? What, how, how does this contribute to the development of new treatments? Well, it provides information about what actual people do in the real life. It can detect signals about the benefits of the, or the risks of a drug that may have, been, may have been around for a long time, but because it's not been used so much, we have not noticed specific risks. It helps formulate hypotheses and treatment targets for further testing, and provides data for the development of assessment tools and informs the way we practice. The more we learn, the more we understand where a drug fits in the treatment of lupus, the better we can treat you. So um, this is an example of an observational study. There, is, um, there are some new tests for lupus. One of them is looking at complement, the complement split products, and it's trying to see if we can better understand how to diagnose lupus. Can we differentiate lupus from some of the lupus-like diseases by looking at this particular test? How about active disease? Can it help us predict activity? Is this test going to become like the hemoglobin A1C? Um, and the hemoglobin A1C is a test for diabetes that tells you how your blood sugar has been, mo has been controlled over the past three months. Will this become the new long-term long -term monitoring tool for lupus? I think we won't know until we do our observational studies. And I want to I, I finish this lecture with 
um, with what I hope and what I, I, I plan to achieve for the future. And I've labeled the slide, I have a dream, just because a lot of people have dreams and some of their dreams have come true. So for this year, what's my dream? I hope that all lupus patients will very eagerly participate in lupus research. Anybody, any takers? Um, how about for next year and for the next five years? I hope that in five years we'll have, and I dream that in five years we'll have multiple drugs approved for the treatment of lupus. And our treatment regimens and our treatment algorithm will be very clear. So multiple drugs, clear algorithm, clear understanding for, pneumo for, for, for lupus. How about in 10 years? Well, I hope in 10 years lupus will be like pneumonia and we can cure lupus. And that's my dream. Thank you. Um, I am, I'm going to. We're going to say questions over here. If you wanted to just say a few words, Dr. Mundo um, is also up at Columbia University, and she is a pediatric rheumatologist. So she's going to talk from the perspective of her specialty, which is our children with lupus. Thanks. So um, I'm a last minute substitution, but I did want to tell you a little bit about lupus in um, children. It's not the same thing. Uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, and uh, I'm very sad to tell you that lupus in young people is often uh, much worse and much more severe. And as my patients would say, that really sucks. <laughs> So the reason that children as young as three and four have lupus is they probably have a greater genetic load, a greater genetic predisposition. <clears throat> so instead of it being environmental, it seems like uh, genetics plays a bigger part. Now children who have lupus are also much more likely to have a family member who has lupus. And they're much more likely to have systemic disease, which can be quite severe. <clears throat> so my patients, 60% of them will have renal disease uh, of the patients. And you might say, how many people get lupus as children? Well, 20% of everyone who will have lupus gets it under the age of 18. But of course, people have symptoms well before they're diagnosed with lupus. So there are probably even more children who could be diagnosed with lupus at a younger age. The other interesting thing we find is sometimes there are clues that there's some autoimmunity going on well before the disease manifests itself. So uh, one of the things that um, we're kind of thinking about doing now is if patients have symptoms or anything going on at a younger age in a family where there's lupus, we're trying to be a little bit more proactive about screening family members to look for those clues. Because uh, if you have a feeling that someone could develop lupus, the earlier we know about it, the more effectively we can treat it. Now, the other thing about lupus in children is that um, it occurs more frequently in men uh, or in boys. And so um, a lot of these teenage boys are quite offended when lupus is thought of as a woman's disease. Uh, and uh, at least in our support groups for younger people, 30 to 40 percent of the participants are, are boys and men. So it's important to make them feel included in our community of lupus patients. Um, and then something else I can tell you about lupus is that the research that goes on in adults is critically important for us to be able to take care of children. Uh, I right now have a four-year-old who is a refugee from Syria. They escaped the war to come to the U.S. Uh, but then this four-year-old suddenly developed some symptoms of uh, losing vision. And at first, no one believed this little child, but it turned out this girl actually has uh, lupus cerebritis. So in addition to trying to get themselves settled in the U.S., they're now dealing with having a very serious chronic disease. Now, some of the treatments, as we know, for lupus are difficult and have a lot of side effects. But something like steroid, steroids has even more side effects for young people. Because at a dose of 10 milligrams a day, a child will not grow. So if you start with lupus at age 4, if I'm only treating you with steroids, we're going to have a big problem because in addition to the weight loss uh, and the predisposition to infection, and you can imagine going to nursery school on prednisone and getting every single infection that comes along. Uh, vaccines are less effective. 
it, it basically affects every part of your development and growth. So I can't rely on steroids to treat these patients. So it's so important that we learn from adult studies what's effective and safe so that we can apply those things to children. The other thing is that children often uh, metabolize. The effects of medication can be quite different uh, in children than they are in adults. And many pharmaceutical companies are reluctant to spend money on studies for children because it's a much smaller group of patients. So if you think it's hard to get a study started in adults with lupus, I mean, you can only Im imagine how much harder it is to get something started in children. Now, the FDA did help us. They did make a law recently, uh, and it's a recent law, that said that uh, if you're starting a new medication that could be given to children, you're required to study it in children. But even so, the studies are very slow in coming. For instance, Benlista has been approved for three years, but it is not FDA approved in children. And that study is only ongoing right now. So if we need to use a different dose or give it differently, you know, we don't know. Uh, we can use it, but we don't have all the information we need to use it effectively. So a lot of that information, we really do look to the adult uh, studies to guide us. Um, but it's not perfect. And then, as you know, many of the medications that we use to treat children have never been FDA approved in children. So most of the things we use right now, we don't even have all the information we'd really like to have. Now, on the bright side, we do have more of those observational studies that Dr. Aspenais talked about. Uh, there was a coming together of the Arthritis Foundation and the NIH, and we created a, a database. Uh, the organization that created it was called CARA. And so we have about 1,000 patients in a database. Now, unfortunately, because the budget there wasn't unlimited as well, we have very limited information. But at least we got a group of patients together, and we can see how they do over the course of uh, as years go by. So uh, and then lastly, to highlight another new program we have, uh, we've discovered that children who have chronic disease really have difficulty uh, if you start with a disease as a child, of course, your parents take care of you and make all the arrangements and decide if a medication is safe. But it's very difficult for people to transition through and become independent. And we're finding that those teenage years, the years really kind of between 16 and 20, 26, are just incredibly high risk, that patients, you know, almost fall between the cracks. Uh, at age 18, they're often asked to find a whole new care team. And with something like lupus, as you know, trust uh, and feeling taken care of by your medical provider is 90% of being able to comply with the regimen, being able to come to your appointments. Um, so having to find a new provider when you're going out to college or starting a, a new part of your life or starting to live alone has been very, very difficult for our patients. And we know that even in places like Canada with national health care where everything is supposed to be seamless, up to 60% of patients with lupus don't transition to the next doctor. They don't make a strong connection. They don't continue their medical therapy. So that's a big problem because we have a lot of years in there where then we have young adults who really are in denial. And they decide that if they're feeling OK, they're not going to see their doctor. But as you know, with something like lupus, it's all about being proactive. And so for those patients, they really do themselves a disservice and often only come back once they have a very serious medical problem, which in the case of child onset lupus is most often renal failure. So, uh, so right now we've created a transition clinic. This is something brand new, but it's to address this high-risk population. And uh, Dr. Aspenas and myself have created a clinic that's going to take people through those high-risk years. So it's going to be a combination of pediatric and adult providers trying to create something that will be a medical home where young people can feel very comfortable. And we're looking at ways that we can uh, improve social support, improve peer education, uh, but also think about how are we doing education? Should education be this, my standing in front of young adults talking to them like this? Or should education be something different? Should it be more of their peers? Or should it be phone app apps? You know, is there some other way we can provide the education so it's more accessible and easier to use? So those are a few of the new things that we're doing in, uh, in um, taking care of lupus patients. Uh, taking care of children is, is incredibly challenging. And uh, you know, again, if a patient has um, uh, disease from age four, they will have that right now the rest of their lives. So the idea that we can actually come to the point where we talk about cure would be sort of my dream as well. 
So yeah, thank you very much, and I'll answer questions later. I know it's hard to sit in a room and listen to people talk for hours at a time, and I really, um, it's really encouraging and exciting to see so many people here today. I just wanted to say that off the top. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about, I kinda wanna leave the I Have a Dream slide up there, but I'll move on. Um, what to expect when you participate in a clinical trial. And one thing I also wanted to touch on really quickly that I think everybody here has said, it's so important to have a team of providers that are, that you're comfortable with, that you trust, that you have a connection with, because lupus is a disease that requires a team effort. You have to, you have a huge role to play and your doctors and nurse practitioners have a huge role to play as well. So um, do the speed dating thing. Walk around and meet all the doctors that are here if you don't like who you're working with right now. Um, so the trials are, um, sometimes cumbersome, it is a, it's a time investment. So ideally, you have a team of people that you're working with that you like to spend time with because um, the enrollment process, the screening, um, there's a lot of, um, the informed consent process, we wanna make sure you understand everything that you're going to be getting involved with, what the risks are, what the benefits are, and um, we wanna make sure that when you sign up for a trial, it's not just because I like my doctor and she told me to do it, so I'm gonna do it. We wanna make sure that you're actually involved in it. Um, you'll have a lot more clinical visits. You might be seeing us um, every two weeks. There's some days where you might spend half a day with us while we're um, with some of the visits, the physical exam, the blood tests. Um, sometimes we're a little bit like vampires and take a lot of your blood, so um, apologize for that in advance. I don't know that there's anything we can do to, to minimize that. Um, and uh, the other thing I think is really important to reiterate about the clinical trials, having said the time investment, is that you really are getting a lot more medical attention. You're seeing your doctors way more frequently. We get to see um, your disease process and how it's going um, you know, day to day in a much more, um, much more immediate sense. Um, there's, there's a ton of regulations around clinical trials and they're, we're very serious about protecting your information and protecting the participants that agree to, part, to, to work with the clinical trials. So like I said about the informed consent, it's an opportunity for you to ask questions. You can always decide, no, this isn't for me. I don't, I don't want to participate. I don't like how this is going. Um, but I, um, I think most people have found that being a part of clinical trials actually improves their care, whether or not you get the placebo or the drug. And I'm gonna skip the details a little bit. Your information is protected. There's a whole system in place for every single trial to protect your information. When you participate, you get assigned a number and your name and personal information does not go out into the, into the ethers of internet world. Um, one more thing on the placebo, the, um, when you're doing a clinical trial, we have to have a control group, which, so we can compare it to something. So even if you are um, randomized or you know, put into the control group where you're getting the placebo, we've seen so much study, so much evidence that people, even if you're getting the placebo, the care is significantly improved. And 90% of the, the solution and the care and the treatment for lupus is having, having, working with people that you trust that, you know, and being compliant and doing your part in um, what you need to, you know, taking your medications, doing the exercises, whatever your role is. Um, so I just wanted to reiterate that, that 90% uh, of it is really getting, and not just for kids. I think it's really true for the group, the high-risk group that Dr. Mundo talked about, but also for adults. I think it's really, sometimes you throw your hands up and feel like I'm not getting better, this isn't working, I'm not gonna take my medication, um, I wanna go on vacation and not think about it, and it's, it's, you know, it's really critical to have a support group that you can lean on, that can check in with you, that can help you get through it. Um, Camilla is one of the most involved patients that we have in the lupus community. She has, of course, participated in trials. She speaks up, she is an advocate, and she's such an active part. Um, 
Thank you, SLE Foundation, for putting this together. Thank you, Peggy. Good afternoon. Earlier I was saying good morning, but <laughs> been here for a while, so. Anyway, I am a lupus patient. I'm Camilla Gilliard, and I wanna talk a little bit about my diagnosis. I was diagnosed around the age of 17, uh, but I had been having symptoms for a long time before that. Um, what is now known to be typical symptoms of lupus, but in the early 90s when I was going through it, a lot of doctors just could not put it together. So even now, you see an average of three or four doctors before you can actually receive a diagnosis. I was diagnosed in 1998. Um, symptoms that I had were hair loss, weight loss, facial rash, extreme fatigue, anemia, joint pain, muscle aches. After diagnosis, I've suffered from brain swelling, minor strokes, blood clots, weight gain, among other things. The last 16 years living with lupus has been a roller coaster ride. There's been ups and downs and highs and low points. But participating in this trial has definitely been a bright star in my journey. I participate in clinical research to benefit myself and the entire lupus community. I feel that it is necessary to take back the power. I live by the motto that I have lupus, but lupus does not have me. <laughs> Dealing with clinical trial participation, I started with the CIS SLE lupus sister research trial. Uh, this is an example of an observational study since no drug was tested. My sister and I would just have blood drawn so researchers could study uh, the familial connections with lupus. Uh, then at the recommendation of my physician, Dr. Cynthia Arano, I took the next step and went into a study testing epituzumab as a potential new treatment for lupus. I've been in this trial now for about three years. Um, I'm now currently in the open label section of the trial, which means that I'm actually getting the drug for sure and there's no doubt in my mind that it's really helping me. So I thank God for that. Um, <laughs> taking part in clinical trials has important physical and emotional benefits. Physically, I'm taking part in the Embody trial, that's the epituzumab, because my doctor and I felt that it was the best treatment option for me at the time. I wasn't doing that great, and there aren't a lot of drug treatments available for lupus patients. I know I'm getting excellent treatment with people who really care about how I'm doing, and it has made a major difference in how I feel physically. Um, I'm going to go with what everyone else said about being a team player and this being a team effort. You have to have a team. You are the captain of your team. You are in charge of your care. No one's gonna care about you more than you can care about yourself, but you have to have a doctor that you can vibe with that's gonna be on your side and gonna take action for you. Now, emotionally, taking part in a trial is very empowering. I feel like I have a sense of responsibility to the lupus community to do everything I can to help everyone dealing with this disease. My earlier years with lupus were not that great, and I would hate anyone to have to go through what I did. Uh, I, like I said, I was diagnosed in the 90s, so lupus drugs, lupus studies, lupus trials have come a long way since 95, 96, 97 when I was in and out of the emergency room, in and out of the hospital every couple of weeks. But it still hasn't come far enough, but it's, it's getting better from my perspective. It helps me to help other people. It makes you feel like you have lupus, but lupus is not in control. You're taking back control over the disease. It makes me feel hopeful on a personal level because I'm helping to do something that could potentially save my own life and helpful on a general level because I am participating in something that could save the lives of other people. I feel strongly that it is especially important for people of color to participate in trials because we are underrepresented in most trials particularly in diseases like diabetes and lupus, where we're the group that is disproportionately affected, if we are not represented in the studies, researchers have no way of knowing if the drugs tested will be safe and effective for us. So I cannot reiterate, please participate if you can. I have found that the people conducting the trials genuinely care and make it as easy as they can for you to participate. 
Initially, they explain everything to you and emphasize that you can withdraw from the study at any time. They go over all the potential side effects with you. You weigh all the risk and benefits for you in conform, instant, informed consent process. I find that the trial coordinators try to accommodate my schedule and needs as much as possible. I go every other Monday for infusion treatment. They make me comfortable with blankets and pillows and darken the room if I want to nod out. And I do nod out. <laughs> I can have people sit with me during the treatment. I'm there for four to five hours, so they also give me lunch. You have to overcome your concerns. The two biggest concerns I hear from other people with lupus are worries about side effects and the time commitment. People say, I don't want to be somebody's guinea pig. They're scared about side effects. I tell them that with every medication, there is a chance of side effects, but the benefits far outweigh the risk. In the informed consent process, the potential side effects are discussed. You do a risk-benefit analysis for yourself. Can I put up with this side effect to get this benefit? I also trust my healthcare professionals. Yes, they need to complete their study, but all the people I've come across are doing this research because they care about helping patients, and I trust that they would not do anything that could be harmful to my health. There is a time commitment, but you have to make a commitment to improve your health. You might be worried about taking time away from work or your children, but you have to make your health a priority or you won't be able to keep a job or raise a family. I think it's so important to take back the power over the disease. You have to have something to hold on to. You will feel good that you're helping yourself and other people in the long run. And if you can do that, I say, why not? Thank you. Okay, so we are going to move on to Q&A, but I again really want to thank the panel and to really, you know, thank Camilla especially because I understand that she did have a flare this week, but she was here today to talk to you guys and not only does... And not only, you know, has she been involved in a trial, but she actively is out there fundraising for um, lupus research and um, she and I had the pleasure of being up in Albany in May for Lupus Awareness Month to advocate for better policies so that when all these clinical trials come to fruition and there's a flood of drugs on the market for lupus, that you'll have access to them. So she really is an amazing um, advocate. So I just wanted to thank her again. So. Um, <laughs> Good afternoon. Oh, I'm loud. I have a question, and please don't think it's, for me it's stupid, but I, I need to ask this. How are the research people using mice to test to see how medication works in a person with lupus? I have lupus. Does a mouse have lupus? or you injecting the medicine in, you know, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, it's a good question. Okay, and thank it's you. It's an excellent question and I appreciate, we appreciate it a lot. So lupus do have um, mice, my, they're, they're mice that are made to have lupus. They've been genetically manipulated to get lupus and mice get lupus. So there are lupus that have mice and that's what we try to do to learn about the medicine in mice first. But people are not mice, and a lot of the time, the medicine that we used in mice that work very well don't work in people, because we would have cured mouse lupus a long time ago. People are more complicated, so we need your help to understand whether something that looks like it may have worked in mice works in people as well. So it's an excellent question, thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to just add something that, um, that research is moving forward and there actually is a model now, you know, mice have a different immune system than humans, but there is a model that's uh, just brand new that you can make a human immune system in a mouse. So it's very powerful and of course if we could, you know, fundraise a lot in the lupus community, right now that model is not being used to study lupus, but if we had uh, fundraising and interest, then that model could be used to study lupus. So I think it's important to know that technology is out there. If we as a community can say this is a priority, we want the NIH to fund this, or we have private donors, then we could get moving on even more effective research right now. Hi, um, I had a 
question for the late, the participants here at the end. I forgot her name. Um, are you able, because you're a part of the clinical trials, are you able to, I know you said it's kind of difficult to have an active life, like with work and children. How does it work for you? Do you work? Do you have children? Or are you just 100% into the lupus trial? Well, I do work. I work part time. Oh. Uh, actually, since starting the clinical trial, I was actually able to go back to work because I wasn't working for a while. So it's enabled me to be able to work. I don't have children yet. No. Oh. So, but that is something that I do one day hope for. Um, the thing about being in a clinical trial is one of the things with the informed consent, you cannot be pregnant and be in specific trials because the drugs, you know, there's just no knowing what the effects could be on the baby. So you, I believe, have to leave the trial four to six months prior to trying to conceive. Oh. So... It's, I mean, I'll have a decision I'll have to make eventually. And if you go, like, on a day to do your treatment and then say you have to work the next day, but say things didn't work out good on the day you went for the clinic, you know, they, you said you go for something on Monday, like um, mm -hmm. some type of drug. What if your body doesn't take to that? Well, like, what do I, you do? I haven't had that experience because actually I go to work usually two hours after I finish treatment on oh. that Monday. So usually okay. the next day I'm, I'm a little tired, a little sluggish, but that's really the only side effect that I have. I don't have headaches. I don't have stomach problems. Like, it works really well for me. Okay. Thank you. And, yeah, just so you know, often if you're in a study, the doctors will work and the team will work extra hard to accommodate you either evenings. I've sometimes accommodated patients on weekends. Uh, so we try to make it doable uh, and try to accommodate the schedule that you have without asking you to stop either school or activities that you're involved in. Um, hi, my name is Sylvia. I kind of like don't want to ask this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, the medications that you use in the trials, what kind of testing do they go through before they are being used for the trials? And how long do they work, work on them before they use them for the trials? So there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of rigor and there are a lot of rules how drugs can move from, from, people, from, from the laboratory into the mouse from the mouse into the monkey, and then from the monkey to people. So, and then from various levels. In, meaning, in the very beginning, the drug is started with healthy people. They're healthy volunteers that say, it's okay, I'm okay with you trying this new drug on me. And they look at all the possible ways in which the drug can affect them. And sometimes the drug doesn't do what it's supposed to do, so it doesn't go anywhere, or the drug is too risky and it's stopped. The FDA watches enormously care. The FDA is our watchdog to make sure that no drugs progress from each stage to the next one without everything being perfect. So in a way, this is a very controlled situation. These are, you know, there's, there's a lot of rigor, there's a lot of attention to making sure that things are done in a very, very clean and, and and as perfect as possible way. Um, by the time a drug gets to level to, to phase three and phase four, they have gone through a lot of studying. A lot of, you know, a lot of people have looked at the data. A lot of people have, you know, have checked the blood in um, the blood to make sure the drug is safe on the blood, have checked the side effects. So things are done in a very organized way. Um, is it perfectly safe? No, because as we learn more, you know, as, as we use the drug in thousands and thousands of people, things that are rare may start occurring. So a lot of the time, drugs are already on the market and new things happen that nobody expected because it was used in a thousand people in a trial. It was used in, you know, a couple hundred people, but now we have thousands and tens of thousands of people are using the drug. So we, we, we are likely to find more side effects and more things. Um, 
is 1 in 1,000 a risky, uh, you know, a big risk? No, it's not. But of course, if you're the one, it's huge. So I think that there's always risk. But as, as the drug moves through the approval process, the risks are smaller and smaller. Hello, ladies. Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Antoinette, and I have the skin, lupus. Uh, I can no longer braid my hair because of the skin disease. I cannot use regular shampoos, makeup. This disease is costing me a lot of money, and these new medications, hopefully, that will come out <laughs> that's probably going to be an arm and a leg for somebody like me that's not making enough money. Now, um, a couple of days ago, uh, I had a problem with my insurance. And I had to end up sh shelling out money out of my pocket, which I had to borrow a couple of dollars just, just to get that medication. You know? Um, what, what, what is the, um, what are y'all, or the companies that are making the, these medications, what are they offering if they are approved? Do, do we get a discount or coupons or uh, how, you know? So I absolutely agree and I've seen this a lot of times where money becomes tight because you lost your insurance, because um, you're not able to work as much as you could. So I think it's a big problem. You're in a very, very hard spot because things are brand new and all this stuff is happening to you and you have to deal with so much. And now you have to deal with the insurance and the money. There are ways that we, the doctors, can help. There are ways that the SLE Foundation can help. Um, there, the majority of the drug manufacturers have patient assistance programs, so, so there is help. Don't, is don't this for the long term, for the rest of my life? So lupus is a chronic disease. It's hard to tell, it's very soon. I don't know, we, don't, it's, we can't tell how bad is it gonna be for you. Is it gonna go away in a couple of months? Is it gonna stay forever? I think we're gonna have to learn about this together not necessarily you and me, but together as in, you know, the doctor and the patient learn about how it's gonna go. There are programs that can help with prescription assistance and we can talk if there's an issue with paying for things that we should talk like privately and discuss your whole situation, but so people know we do have social, like I'm a social worker and we provide patient services, so you can get in contact with me if you have any questions, anyone else, um, any similar questions to answer next. And I would like to kind of wrap up and give you guys maybe a, a chance to finish up talking with the folks that came in. But again, I really want to thank our panelists today. And I want to thank all the exhibitors that came today and thank all of you for coming out today. Is this your glasses? And thank you, the SLE Foundation.